idea of what I've been doing. Although this talk is not like the one I gave last year, it's made up of mainly totally different photographs. Um, basically, I got interested in the big cat phenomenon in 1984 when I first saw a puma stalking a badger, as I was a bit of a nocturnal naturalist. Uh, and I used to watch badgers and owls and deer at night, and I got more than I bargained for by seeing cats. I was living in Central Dorset, North of Granford Forum, and that first experience led me to see uh, the same female puma, and she had cubs in a nearby quarry in the same year, of which I saw four times. And after then, I've seen cats up to date 17 times within Dorset, Hampshire, and Wiltshire. Although well, most of the time, I certainly do not see cats at all. Um, I started to do field evidence um, about 10 years ago, and in the last six years, I started to concentrate very deeply into the cats that were in my area, going not just on people's sightings, but on the wildlife, the terrain, the topography of the land, um, field signs I was getting from those areas. And I allocated myself six study areas, one of which I've almost abandoned, but five study areas I regularly visit. And one study area in particular has been so hot with sightings and field signs for the past five years, I tend to go there more than I do in the other places. And it's the island of Perlac in South Dorset. Now, first of all, I'm not going to start on particular field evidence of what you'd expect. Now, I mean, you cannot see this very well because there are no curtains or blinds to hide this. Um, so I'm sorry about that. But this is one of the, um, the bad slides anyway. But if you can see that, it's a historical and microscopic observation of big cat hair and unknown hair samples. I have collected over 200 samples of hair. Not any hair, but hair possibly from large cats, just in Dorset over the last four years. And a lot of those batches of hair I tried to get analysed. And I couldn't get anyone to do genetic testing on them, but I had somebody from Bournemouth University who decided to help me out for free and do cross-hair cross analysis on those hairs. She works, she works in um, she worked in the forensic department, forensic archaeology, that's what she worked in. So she was very good at doing her hairs. She spent years studying um, hairs from archaeological sites and things like that. And when she started the study, she thought, well, I'm not really believe in big cats in Britain, but I'll help Jonathan out. Um, so she did. And I gave her 70 batches of hair, <coughs> of which I thought were puma, lynx, and leopard. And there may have been one or two batches of hair that, that were heavily mixed. Um, it was a very big task for her. This took her a year to do. And... These are some of the hairs, for example, I would give her. I'm trying to get this in focus. See it. They're basically little tiny packs of hairs. I have a lot of fire of them up there, and you can have a look through if you want. Now, most of the hair I collected was in areas of which I knew the cats were active. Not just people sighting, but areas where I was finding remains of kills, such as deer, geese, swans, foxes even, things like that, and areas where scats were deposited on a regular basis. So I was picking up a hair from the nearest vicinity of what I presumed were um, territorial boundaries of these cats. As the majority of cats would bury their scats in, within their territory, but on the borders they often leave their scats unburied on purpose as a sign to, um, to other cats 
of their territorial boundaries, although they're not as territorial as people presume. <clears throat> so it was batches of hair like that. Now the hair I was taking from barbed wire yeah. fences was more likely to be hairs from carnivores rather than hairs from deer, for example, because deer do not have an underfur, they only have guard hair, which is very distinctive, it's air-filled, and it's very wobbly, and it's very soft. Cat hair is very similar to dog hair, it's very fine, and there's usually an underfur, especially with cats, there's a generally a thick underfur. Most of the hair was taken by barbed wire fences above two foot above ground level as well, usually on the bottom strands of bottom wire of the fence, occasionally from the inner wire or the top wire. Occasionally this hair was taken from brown bushes or edges of bracken going through runs to areas where I presume the cats would be um, hunting. Now I gave um, Laura Evans, who did all this work, matches of um, all the British wildlife you'd expect to find in the area, all the British mammals, and matches of genuine puma, leopard and lynx hair for comparison. Such as this, she photographed them all, this is a genuine puma undercoat hair, for example. And Unfortunately, we 
have the proper money to send these back in the genetic analysis, it's very pricey. Although myself and David Mitchell have been helping me look for somewhere, we haven't actually come to anywhere where we can send such a big batch for a small amount of money. We're still working on it, aren't we, David? Um, we might come up with a solution one day to get them genetically tested. Right, other, other evidence I've been getting lately is um, the island of Portland, I don't know if any of you know it, in South Dorset, just to the west of Purbeck, has had multiple cat sightings in the last 10 years. <coughs> and I decided to go there with both Darren Nash and Mark North last summer in a quest to look for the alleged Portland links. We were only there for one day, yet in that day we gathered loads and loads of evidence. First evidence we found was decapitated corvids um, carrying crow heads and bodies dotted around the place. And I first presume they could have been foxes, but um, it is known to be a trait of insects to decapitate their, their victims. But within the same layer of box in this particular quarry, I started to find droppings and footprints. And as you can see there, there are the two best footprints we found. They've been rain and it's very lime so Unfortunately, the footprints have set rock hard in the line. But we couldn't pass the castle because there's people walking up and down all day and they just would have ruined it. But as you can see there, especially in the top one, the typical leading toe of a cat, it's very broad and wide, not particularly big, but an average size for a link, which is between six and seven centimetres and bottom, very similar. And I've compared it with a textbook link you can see along the side, on the right hand side there, taken from one of the um, cold skies of European mountains. So that was great. Not only did we find these guys, we found droppings all over the place within one or two areas of Portland, especially the Tout Quarry. There's a closer picture there of, of one of the footprints. Not only will we be finding droppings of what looked like from an, an adult animal, but we found smaller droppings which could have come from a cub. And they are also um, of a different consistency to the larger droppings, which is often the case with cubs. The smaller droppings were around a big can of rocks. So we came to the conclusion that there was an adult link with a cub, and we found no reason to think otherwise. Strangely enough, Portland, I'm not sure whether any, of you, whether any of you know Portland, but it's built up of loads and loads of quarries and rocks, which is an ideal denning site for cats. These are some of the droppings we were found. Strangely enough, the top dropping, which I have over there at the back, is made up of dog fur, and it looks like a small terrier. Um, entirely of dog fur, but within it there are also hairs that match exactly those hairs of the leaf. So I had to conclude that that leaf had somehow pinched somebody's pet dog. We did also find remains of fox, didn't we, down um, in one of the small caves. So it could be that the leaves have been eating fox and grub. I know several people that live on Portland and they've told me there's been a drastic drop in the number of foxes over the years and they never knew why. And there's also been a reduction in rabbits as well and they never knew why. <laughs> this is the rock layer in which we found those dropping. We found the, uh, the paw prints sort of down the edge of this quarry along the track that goes along the edge of the cliff top. There's about a 300 foot drop right down to the beach. There's a lot of seabirds, such as fulmers, and a few guinea moths nesting along these cliffs, and there are lots of rabbits there as well. So there's plenty of food. But I don't believe the island of Portland can be home for cats all the time. I believe it's just a denning site for cats are coming in from the surrounding countryside. They're walking along um, a small, um, um, what's it called? So it's on the beach. Yeah, yeah, of Along the beach and adjoining the road to the island, staying on there, maybe to bring up the cubs whilst they're at the smallest, and then taking the cubs away into the surrounding countryside as they get bigger. That's my theory, anyway. 
This is how you get to Portland. This is the only route onto it. This is the Chesil Valley. It comes along there. I have studied these um, areas ar around here. It is, it is possible for a cat to inch its way along there. There are ditches and um, it could easily sneak along there during the night time. Once it's on the island, of course, it's very safe. There's many places where it can hide. Right, on to our cameras. Um, David Mitchell bought these cameras. We only bought the only bought two, and we've been using them for about a year now, I think, isn't it, David? We've had no good results. All we've had is pictures of wild animals. Now, I put these um, cameras, um, both of them were in a spot in a nature reserve, but also well, a trust nature reserve, where we knew there were cat activity, but they were a bit out of the way. So I could only um, empty this camera about every two weeks or so. But we've had the batteries were going so soon that there'd probably be about a week of nothing, because I couldn't go every day and change the batteries on, unfortunately. But we did get lots of blank shots. Um, the cameras aren't particularly good because they flash about two seconds after an image has been um, captured by an infrared beam. So an animal that's going quite far, or quite fast could actually go right past a camera, it will flash and take a picture of nothing. So we've got so many pictures of nothing, there could have been a cat passing that camera and unfortunately we missed it. So we, one of our cameras unfortunately was stolen. We did put a dead seeker carcass in front of one of the cameras on another of my study areas, um, the Milton Abbas estate, just north of Black Forum. That carcass was not touched for a whole month, and actually, in fact, it wasn't touched by anything, strangely enough. But what we did do, we put extract of lynx glands all the way around it. It may be that that um, put a lot of the other. Um, wild animals off, which in a way would have been a good thing, because no fox ever touched that, no badger touched it, there was ravens and buzzards in the area and it wasn't touched by anything. I actually done that myself, I skinned half of that and opened it up to make it even more visible and nothing touched that animal. Maybe we were being a bit optimistic and thinking a big cat will come and scavenge it, but maybe another cat had smelt the lynx glands we had put around there and thought, oh, it's a territory of an animal, and they're not put here. I do not know, but whatever happened, that deer was not touched, which is really, really unusual. But what we do get is pretty pictures like foxes posing like that. We have got lots of other pictures of um, badgers and deer coming up to a camera, eyeballing it and things like that, big hairy cattle and things like that, one that looks like a buffalo. and. Um, squirrels and things like that, but no big cats, unfortunately. So that was proving very, very difficult. Um, this is one of my study areas where there has been so many cat sightings. It's actually bound back to front. If any of you know South Perth, you realise that. But we're looking into a valley of Tynum. On this side of the hill is um, the Lower Firelink Ranges used by the Royal Armoured Corps. And it's a huge area of heathland where people do not go. There's a huge herds of seeker deer, and there are loads and loads of cat sightings, even by military personnel themselves. This is the fire ranges. I'm not sure whether you can make it out, but it's a vast area of heathland, fields, swamps, and bogland, and waterways that um, lead right the way up to the um, western edge of Cool Harbour. And that there, I believe to be the centre of a territory of a female um, leopard that has cubs. Now I've got reason to believe that because all around the outskirts of this territory where I have permission to go or that are on public rights of way, I maybe go twice a week and find footprints. And some of the footprints I'm finding are typical leopard footprints, They're not particularly big. So first of all, I conclude it's either a small leopard or maybe a female leopard. 
but the amount of animal kills I'm finding from this area, such as dead deer, a lot of them are pictured down below, of which I found two fresh dead deer in a day, would So alongside the largest gas, so I did conclude that there was a cub, at least one cub, with an adult female. This is a quarry in the site, nobody goes to it, it's on the firing ranges, and I'm sure there's a lot of um, cat happenings within this quarry. Thick forest, as you can see, goes for miles and miles. But these are the type of things I'm finding in the area. This is just a few miles <coughs> northwest just on the, on the edge of the edge of Via Regis, which has had multiple sightings for at least a decade. I'm finding sick hides that are dragged underneath tree roots. And as you can see, the, um, the skin has been peeled right off of it. All the hind quarters are eaten, as well as the hind limbs. Um, there was a fudging, but it was nearby. It might have been dislocated by a fox at a later date. But all the flesh totally stripped, the, uh, the ribs licked clean, and the face, facial muscles licked clean as well. And on this particular animal, as you can see, just by the nose, it had a large area of grazing. A lot of my animals, well, deer carcasses I'm finding in this particular area all have the same injuries. So it's evidence to me that whatever animal's killing them is holding it right over the nose and mouth to suffocate it rather than a bite to the neck or the back of the neck as a lot of cats do. A lot of leopards kill their animals like that. As you can see on this one, the, the face, half of the face has been eaten. The other side of the head is perfectly intact. And the torso has been moved over by a heavy animal so it could get underneath the flesh underneath. No fox ever eats like that. It's meticulously clean. There's no hair scattered around the district. There's not a trail of hair leading from the road even. There's, there's nothing else to suggest that any other wild animal has actually touched that animal apart from one or two cats eating at one sitting at the same time. This is another animal, exactly the same area. It was very fresh, its eyes were still bulgy. It obviously died from asphyxiation. You can see how neat the flesh has been taken right up to the base of the skull. And the base of the skull is often crushed and the brains leaked out as well. And that's what I'm finding from a lot of the deer carcasses in my area. This animal is from a different area. This is from my most northerly study area in an area called Martin Down Nature Reserve. It's a national nature reserve and it's an area of natural chalk downland, grassland and a lot of wooded areas. A lot of gamekeeping and there's those for fallow deer. And this is the remains of a fallow deer skeleton. This again is another sea deer. Back to my um, firing ranges in, in the south. This was another animal. The strangeness about this animal was on the side of a road. Now, I found many animal carcasses on the edges of the road. That does not necessarily mean that it was killed by a car. But what I did know was that they were, killed, they were eaten by cats. And when I looked at all the bones, there's nothing to, to suggest that they had been hit by vehicles. So what I concluded was, the animals, and I think were leopards, would know that the deer would wait at the other side of a road for the cars to pass, so it was a perfect ambush place for cats to stalk. 
and I was finding these carcasses dotted along this road within a 10 mile area. Most of them were not hit by cars, but a lot of them were hit by cars, they weren't touched by cats, but some of them were. Some of them were definitely hit by cars, and they had broken bones, pelvises, um, femurs, and things like that, and they were still scavenged by cats. So I concluded that the leopards were finding a great ambush situation for the deer that waked across the roads, and they were also scavenging on those deer that had been hit by vehicles. That's the same animal there. You can see the sinking deer by the white big open patch um, just below the knee and my hind legs. You can see it's been heaved by a heavy animal over to one side while it's been eating it. Cats are so strong. That's what they do, they lift an animal up to turn it over and to get the meat on the other side, just different position. These were at Martin Down Reserve in my most northerly district. <coughs> These were hidden under a hedge. There's a, the, an ancient herd of fowl over there, and a lot of them um, grow deformed antlers. And, as you can see there, both of them have deformed antlers. The one on the left is on its side, and all of its skull is eaten the front and the back. There's another one lying to the top, you can see its molars lying on the very topmost part. Again, that was half eaten as well. Um, there's been regular sightings of leopard in the area, and there have been four sightings of cubs. One person saw an adult leopard with three cubs. I actually saw two cubs myself um, two years later after this. And there wasn't a mother friend of them, but the two cubs were chasing a leopard around the field. So it's a very active area. We're often called the Cranbourne Cat because it's a large area, about 18 miles in circumference, that stretches from Burwood, Cranbourne, and then back to Wimbledon St. Giles. This is um, a seeker head showing the classic signs of where a large cat takes the, the whole muzzle in its mouth to suffocate it with typical um, damage caused by its canine and incisors as it bites into the muzzle of the animal there. And of course it's not just leopards I'm finding in these areas. This is what I believe to be a footprint of a puma. I've come to the conclusion there's both puma and leopard living in the same districts. They obviously keep out of each other's way, but the puma are tending to stick to the higher ground, whilst the leopards are tending to stick to the lower valleys, the woodland, um, the marshy areas where the large herds of sea deer are. And the puma tend to be keeping to the higher hills where there's lots of bow deer and hares. I'm finding so many scats, it's unbelievable. I don't, half of them I don't photograph. I photograph the entrance through ones, or the ones that show like deer hooves sticking out of them perhaps, or, or, or whiskers of foxes in them, or which I do. And lately I've been using my um, big cats and Britain um, keely just to show as, uh, you know, it's better than a coin. I'm finding these scats all over the place, and it's one reason how I've managed to, um, to suss up the territories of the animals. Because within their territories, they make scrapes. What they do is they scrape up a patch of soil or pine needles or leaves on the forest floor, and then they will, they will deposit in it either urine or feces, and then cut them over. Um, and that's what they usually do. I think, I think both pumas and leopard do that, but I think puma other people say tend to leave them open rather than cover them up as a leopard, so people say it usually does, but I do not know. Uh, all I know is I'm finding all these scats in my study areas, a lot of them are open and a lot of them are closed. The ones that are open I find are always open and they're on particular beats, either the edge of a forest or an edge of a lake, an edge of a road. So I can conclude that it's a territorial boundary, and that's how I came to my conclusions of various um, 
territories within my study areas. I believe that one to be a leopard dropping, as it's in Studland Heath, and it contains a mass of deer hair. This one I believe is from a different animal, it's upside down, but it doesn't matter, you can still see it. That's feeding on squirrels, and that's a mixture of um, two different skeletons of squirrels within that scat. It's actually up there at the back. And this animal was deposited in scat on the edge of a railway line. There's another one there. Um, a lot of these droppings decompose really, really quickly. Um, there are beetles called minotaur beetles that are kind of a dung beetle and they, they bury them really quickly. And there's also a tight fly that sort of lays in, um, in carnivore feces and the maggots quickly eat it as well. So we don't hang around very long, but you might find traces of bone weeks later in the summer and even the fur disappears because clothes moths naturally eat the fur from carnivore droppings and so they get to work as well, so they don't hang around for very long. There's another one there with large fragments of what I believe to be fox bones, and there's actually a fox's claw there in the middle. I'm actually finding feces with fox whiskers in as well. Also, in some of my droppings, I was finding vegetable matter, and it really put me off because I thought, oh dear, um, the thing is, I knew how badgers deposited their droppings, like usually in the trees, rather than just really nearly all over the place. And I'm very familiar with fox scats, but I was finding very, very large droppings, say 25 centimetres plus, that were containing cherry stones. And I was thinking, well, that's a bit weird. But the more research I read into it, I found that a lot of these large cats actually eat a lot of vegetable matter, including the fruit. And it could be that some of these leopards were actually eating cherries, as well as elderberries and things like that. As well as all the normal rabbit hair and deer hair that's in that particular dropping. That's a normal one there, that's just for rabbit hair, for example. I find this a very um, important part of my biological findings as species. A lot of people go, ooh, what do you want to figure out who but to me, it was more evidence of big cats in a poo than it is in a photograph. And if I only had somebody to, to test them, to, to, uh, to analyse them for DNA, that would be great. But you need flesh scan to do that. It would have um, cells from the lining of the stomach of the animal within it. And I do have about 20 scats in my freezer, ready for somebody to do that. This is a scrape. There was a dropping buried underneath that. They're not all easy to see, always to see scrapes, but if you go over the forest floor and find little mound of leaves, often they look damp, and you know that something has moved them from their natural position. And that would be about this bit, for example. So that's like a typical uh, leopard scrape, of which I'm finding more and more often in my study area. There's another one here. Underneath this vegetation that's growing up, all these leaves have been piled up, and there was a large dropping underneath that. They don't always put droppings on the scrape. They often do them as a visual sign for another cat will be walking on the path. Sometimes they just scratch with their claws, and somehow that acts as a visual marker for another cat. Sometimes they spray with fury. This is another one as well. Leaves and bracken and grass have been raked up. There was no scat in this particular one, but it had been sprayed on. <clears throat> this was a puma dropping. This wasn't in Dorset. This was in Hampshire after... Um, I keep kept on getting reports from a, rail from a train driver who several times saw a puma on a railway embankment just outside Southampton. And I went down three times. I walked on the edge of the railway line and I found several puma scats such as this one inside the spruce forest. This would have been feeding on one jack deer. And that was another one of an unidentified animal, but possibly lynx. This was in um, the Milton Abbas estate area, where there had been 
reports of two links run over in a year. And um, although I haven't seen many signs of links, um, I've gone through these woodlands and I found lots of scats that look very similar to links scats. And that was one of them there. In the new forest of which I do some research, we're getting, I get so many reports from the new forest, but I'm getting a lot of old reports, sometimes 30 or 40 years old. People tell me they see a puma walking in front of them they need horse flying, for example. Um, they, they tend to be being more relaxed now and they're coming out with their reports. A lot of foals in the new forest go walking, so nobody seems to know where they go. Some say, yes, yeah, it's for a food train or dog food or whatever, it's for French. But I've got different ideas. I think the cats are taking some of the smaller foals. And John Poland, the member of Southampton Natural History Group, passed on these photographs to me, which to me look like they've been by a cat and they could possibly have been killed by a puma. And there's nearby species as well. Now this looks like a wild cat, doesn't it? There tends to be more and more reports of wild cats in the southern England these days. And there's a chap who I was hoping was going to come to this conference and tell you about the wild cats he's been finding in Dartmoor. He's a taxidermist like myself, and he's picked up three such cats in the middle of Dartmoor where he lives. Now he proved that they were wild cats because a wild cat's lower jaw stands up on its hinges and domestic cats do not. Um, well, I haven't got a picture of that jaw standing up but it certainly does and I've got no reason to believe that this is anything else but a wild cat. And it certainly looks like it. it's got a short, very thick tail although there could be some hybridisation somewhere, that's the type of point, but it's certainly more wild cat than domestic cat. I've actually been fortunate enough to see one myself in Dorset, which obviously isn't too far away from Dartmouth. So wild cats could be spreading back into Dorset from the West Country. Whether they were always there and overlooked is debatable or reintroduced, we just do not know. This is um, sightings within my study area, well, within the whole county of Dorset and the New Forest, and just over the border into, into Wiltshire. So this is today the amount of sightings um, that have been reported and I got hold of within my whole area. As you can see, there's large clumps around Paul Harbour down in the middle and the south. That's my area of where in the forest where I'm finding all my areas. And there's more clumps up to the north. That's in my area of Martin Down Nature Reserve and the Cranbourne area. So all these people's sightings are actually tying in with the areas in which I'm gathering all my field evidence from. <laughs>
John, have you noticed us when you've got the carcass half eaten like that? Do you think about putting the camera up near it? I think about it, but they're not. Half the time they're on land of which I do not know who the owner is whatsoever. Um, and I find them dotted around all over the place. It's as if I should be putting 10 or 20 cameras up, which is impossible. I'm looking for a carcass in an area of um, wildlife trust land. So I've got permission to put cameras up on Dorset Wildlife Trust land. As yet, I have not found many carcasses on wildlife trust land. The ones that I have found, I've only found the old carcass, and I haven't found any other signs to suggest that the animal uses it as a regular beat. As soon as I do, there's going to be one of David's cameras put up there, and hopefully we will get the evidence we need. That is another fallow deer on um, Martin Down Reserve. It was attracted by foxes afterwards, and you can actually see where the foxes have chewed on the ribs. When a big cat eats ribs, it actually crunches them down with its carnassial teeth that are like shears, and, and they get straight edged basically. But when you get frayed rib ends like that, it's going to be a fox that have got far weaker jaws, and they tend to fray them like that. Of course, foxes are attracted to um, these remains of kills by big cats. And a lot of people get put off because they see signs of foxes in the vicinity, like scats or footprints, and they say, oh, it's just been eaten by a fox. But you've got to look at the typical um, ways in which a big cat eats. And the chances are it's been eaten by both, firstly by a cat, secondly by one or more foxes. Strangely enough, I do not get many reports of um, farm livestock being attacked, not in my study area. The main reason for that, I believe, is because there's such a high density of wild animals. There's so much deer around, hares and rabbits, the cats do not want to eat sheep. The reports I do get are actually dog attacks. Uh, these were from a farm in the northern Wimborne area. These two sheep, there's actually five of these sheep, have been mauled and their rear haunches have been badly bitten. Um, they're green because that's the antiseptic you put on it and it, you can't see the red. But the farmer was convinced it was a big cat and said, no, sorry, it's dog attacks. When a big cat attacks a sheep, it kills it immediately and you may not find it again. It might be dragged away, never to be seen, or you'll see it cleanly eaten. You will not see fur spread all over the place, blood and guts. That's what dogs do. And a lot of the time, the dogs do not know how to kill the sheep, but they might slowly um, devour it and it will possibly die. A lot of the time, it doesn't die. So you know a cat has not been work. When a cat kills, it kills the purpose and that's to eat it. I went out with Marcus, uh, when was it Marcus, last year, we had a report um, of a farmer who had 15, was it 14 or 15 of his lambs were killed. And he was convinced it was a big cat because he had seven reports of big black cats being seen on his land in the nearby vicinity. So myself and Marcus had a look at these sheep, we thought, well no, it's not typical big cat behaviour. 15 lambs just bitten through like that, we bought the work of dogs. I said to him, there's a badger set up there, do you want to take me to it? So we did, he wondered why. When we got to the badger set, there was a telltale signs of badger tickets to be at work, the typical square spade holes, and the grass roots had not dried up, they were fresh, and it coincided with the same night as these animals were killed, so I said, there's your verdict, badger diggers had uh, given themselves some sick grizzly sport and dogs have been the culprit of these lamb attacks. And I reckon 70% of the time attacks on sheep are attributed to dogs rather than cats. I have shown this slide before, but there's changes in these territories. What you see are my areas of which I fought two years ago were possible leopard territories. The red Boundaries of the males encompassing the green, which are females. But they've changed. The ones um, on the far left hand side have changed because, in some areas where I used to uh, constantly find droppings on one path, they suddenly disappear. And I go to another part of the field where there'd obviously be droppings and they would disappear. So I presume they had gone. Also, in the north, um, below 
Shastri, there's an area where I regularly found droppings which I knew was a border of a male left his territory. Those droppings have now been moved, and any time I go there, I can find any droppings. So that animal has either been shot or run over on the road, or for some reason, it's moved. A lot of those other territories within the south of the region there are generally the same. There's one animal that's been there for six years and its territory boundaries has not changed. I can constantly find droppings along an area where, the, where they've not changed for six, um, six years. The only problem is it's on National Trust land. National Trust will not give me permission to put up cameras, unfortunately. One of the footprints given to me uh, not long ago on the edge of a new forest. This is one of the um, anomalies of um, footprint analysis. A lot of footprints are passed to me, I do not conclude as dogs, but they do look very much like cats, but they do show claw marks. As you can see in that picture, there are claw marks. But they're not the typical claw marks you will expect a dog to make. They are very thin and knife-like, which suggests to me that there are some cats that do certainly walk with their claws out, or a lot of the time. Now, a lot of professional zoologists just write off any um, spore prints that have claw marks. I think, no, of you know there's dogs. I tend to disagree. I think one of these species of cats we have out there, for some reason or another, shows its claws a lot of the time. Don't know why, maybe it's just a weird species, maybe it's a genetic problem with their feet, I do not know. So that's a without claw marks, possibly puma again. That's in the new forest. You can hardly see that, sorry, but it is in the centre there. And I concluded that was leaks. I'm getting more and more leaks um, footprint. This is my study area, miles and miles of beautiful heathland and forest. This is not, this is um, Arn, RSPB Nature Reserve on the edge of Cool Harbour. And I go all around these hills and forests and I'm finding signs all over the place. And we're getting so many reports of cats seen in these areas, not just black cats, but black cats with brown cats. Now that is very strange. It could mean that you are getting brown, chocolate brown leopards for some reason or another. Or could they be pumas? I do not know. It is very, very strange indeed. But they certainly do look like <coughs> leopards. And this is what they're feeding on. Huge herds of sea deer around the Cool Harbour. There are thousands of them. There's going to be 3,000 um, sea deer around the edges of Cool Harbour. And they all encroach into reed beds in the early morning and the evening, and this is where I find a lot of my signs. Um, that's another view um, looking towards Bournemouth from um, the heathland between Studland and Swanage, Godwick Stone Heath. Vast areas of open heathland. It is open to the public, you get a lot of people there. But I'm finding the signs tend to diminish as summer comes because all the people come to the beaches, the cats seem to move further away from the coast into the deeper forest. The methodology of Port Harbour there. And just a nice missing morning on to end on that. Okay, thank you.
young leopards being born somewhere within Dorset every year. Those young will stay with the parents up to two years. Then they will move out to the territory of the world. Um, possibly the male animals will look further, maybe even a female. I do not know. But somehow, some animals are being replaced by others. Whether they're larger animals, stronger, that are fighting with the smaller ones, I do not know. But the territories are certainly moving around. They're never the same, apart from the one animal that's been there for six years. And I presume that animal is an old male leopard. He's got huge feet. And you can see some of his prints down there, they actually fit in there. Maybe he has the upper hand and nobody's managed to challenge him. Yeah. The reason I'm asking that is because we believe we've got one particular brand that we found there. It's got two independent territories um, that is quite adjacent to each other but with a gap in. Yeah. It's, it's a significant sign of the way it um, travels around the territory. Mm. But this male has actually got, again, nicks in his ears and has been seen at different times. And we can tell it's the same character. Right. But it is like two areas alongside each other, but with a gap in the middle. So it's as though it's moving from one territory to another territory. They do and that. I found that some of my animals, especially males rather than females. The females do it when I find they're having cubs. They have particular areas, maybe an older female that's had cubs more than once, knows of an area where she's got safe dating sites, so she will have a territory there, then she'll move somewhere else where she knows yeah. she's got ample food somewhere else. And apart from that, they may be even searching for more females. Um, if it's a male, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So why, uh, yeah. Why isn't that just one territory, not two territories? Well, Alan just said it's the same cat because it's been seen. It's got Nixon in his ears. It's Nixon in his ears. It's a male. Why is that one big territory? Yeah. Why do you, just, why do you think it's two territories? Yes. Yeah. Because it's, yeah. Yeah. in one way, it's travelling clockwise. And when it's been seen in the other area, it seems to be travelling anti clockwise. And so, so you might get figure of eight. I was about to say, you can remember. Yeah. There's not, yeah, there's not a lot of research done on how cats actually um, patrol their so-called territory, whether they zigzag along it or go around the perimeter or not. It's really difficult. They do it in, in all different ways, I think. But it's the fact that yeah. the, the, the ears on this cat is so distinctive yeah. that we're thinking, well, I think... Sound like man, we'll figure away, tracks for a sound. Yeah. Like, you're the history. Uh, it could, it could be. Like figure yeah. eight. Yeah. That's like it. That's probably going back to a central point at one time. So yeah. That's a like safe point. And then it'll work its way. Thank you, you're right, because we go from one territory and then we're losing it. And it's turning yeah. up in another area. Mm. And we're thinking, well. You may use a narrow band where it crosses yeah. from one region to another. Okay, sure. Okay. Sure. sure. Yeah. Um, pertinent to that point. Speak with any knowledge of the particular species of that animal, but um, I, I believe studies done on domestic um, quote unquote cats show that they sometimes deliberately leave neutral corridors for other cats to use to avoid conflict. Yeah, I think so that's a great possibility. possibility. I think that's a great possibility. Yeah. Mm. Certainly, some of my areas that are like two separate areas <coughs> where I find signs. And there certainly is an area in between where I never find sign. <coughs> um, I just I never know why, but um, that could be a good explanation. Almost yeah. like an exclusion zone. In a free zone for everyone to come. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I know I have disturbed cats several times. Um, one of my best sightings of cats was with um, a mother puma and two cubs. And when I went uh, one day I saw a mother, the next morning I saw the two cubs and then they were never there again. So I'm sure I disturbed them sadly and I didn't catch up with them ever again. It could be also that. Obviously, um, if the cat's disturbed, it will move its cubs, just like foxes do. They have several dating sites. If they're not safe, they will move them. I'm sure cats 
will have certain sites where they take their cats if they if they cut if they feel threatened at all. Sounds unusual to not then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions, John? When you when you say you see some dark, some black, uh, jet black uh, puma or panther um, with brown ones, you, you mean uh, so black with uh, black panther with spotted uh, panther? Or? No, there are more and more reports of a jet black animal being seen with a chocolate brown animal. They both look like leopards. Being seen alongside. Yeah. Um, now a lot of the fur I'm getting, which I know is from the leopard type animals, has got a reddish brown tip to it. I'm not sure that's normal with normal melanistic leopards, mm. but it's certainly the same in all these areas I'm getting hair from. They are jet black, but with a reddish tinge to it. So maybe some are becoming reddy brown all over rather than just black. I don't know. There's certainly been no spotted leopards seen yeah. in any of my areas at all. There's got to be a minimum of eight leopards in all of my study areas. That's the amount of cubs seen over the years with the gaps. And you say a cubs might stay with the parent for up to two years. There's got to be a mother, there's got to be a father. And there's been at least five lots of cubs seen over the last ten years. There's got to be a minimum of eight. Um, there could be 20 or so leopards just in Dorset alone. That's one of the reasons, as I come to the statistics earlier, of thousands of these animals. Why should Dorset be any different than anywhere else? I know it's got a lot of deer in it, um, but there's certainly got to be far more of these animals out there than people have ever envisaged. And certainly on studies done on jaguar and leopard in South America and Africa, they've found so many animals um, and their territories would be much smaller than they always previously thought. Sorry, I mean, your, that was very interesting, but I mean, yeah. your, your bird sightings, you've seen big black ones, I've seen, I've seen pumas, leopards, and only things only twice. But, um, yeah. Only twice? <laughs> 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 You don't have any, any picture of those leopards and pumas, you couldn't... No, they're only fleeting glimpses. I could not possibly have time to photograph my yeah. long men. One time an animal was too close for me to photograph, so I had a 1200mm lens, and it was only two metres in front of me walking under the tussocks of Pumalinia, that's purple moor grass, and it was, it was far too close. Ladies and gentlemen, John McGowan.